got the interview with CBS, did it all, and they never aired it because, like, it was yeah. an issue. Uh, yeah, a little bit. It was Imagine little, nowadays. Yeah. So it was a little bit of an issue because I killed off 300 people, and, like, they were fairly <laughs> grotesque, like, murders. Some of wow. them, some of them were easy. Welcome to Room 6, a channel dedicated to the local Las Vegas music scene and the people that make it, including me. I'm Josh, and today I am very happy to welcome a truly, truly talented and slightly avant-garde musician. Well, thank you. Named Gregory Michael Davis. Say hi. I'm Greg. Hi. Hi. Um, and basically, we're here to talk about what whole, should have happened last week. <laughs> sure. Um, it, as of this as of time of recording yesterday, he had his CD release party at Vinyl inside the Hard Rock. Yeah, inside the Hard Rock. And it's a sister uh, venue to the joint. Yes. And you had uh, Robo Tuxedo there, Grant Cox. Yep. I had uh, Robo Tuxedo and Chameleon Queen open up the show, which were the two musicians that I handpicked for the event. Right on. Do you have another show coming up? Soon? No, I'm not a big fan of performing, to be honest with you. Okay. And it's not so much that I don't like performing. It is that I, um, I'm not a fan of oversaturation. I figure a lot of what attracts people to me is the fact that I'm slightly mm -hmm. off kilter. And if you do that all the time, then you're just normal. Well, I think if you've got a, a mark, a, I hate to say the word marketable, but if you have a product, product or, you know, a presentation that people are enjoying and you're saying, oh, you only get it sometimes, you don't get this all the time. It, right. Then it becomes, he's playing, he's playing. Right. Yeah. I've done one show in 2020 or See, 2019. Wow. Well, um, there is a show that I have my eyes on. Oh, okay. I can't say too much information about that because I can't guarantee that I'll get the show. Mm. But there is indeed an idea that I have. So let's see if it works out. Okay. Well, definitely keep me posted. I shall. Um, I unfortunately couldn't make it to your show, and I really do apologize. But um, reviews are good and uh, getting positive response. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is always fun, you know. Not entirely why we do it, but it is good to uh, get the old pat on the back once in a while. Right. I see. I'm kind of the opposite. I I'm a bit of a stage whore. I admit it, <laughs> and I, I love the performing part of it. But I hate I hate the you know packing up and loading it. Oh, it's the worst part. Yeah. For having a nine piece band. Yeah, a ten piece. I had a ten piece once. Oh, it's the worst. Yeah, and I was just a singer, so everybody expected me to help. Yeah. You know? uh, but I I uh, not fond memories. Um, I don't miss that, but I do miss it, the, when you're on stage, it's over before you know, if you, if you've done it, if you prepare right. Right. And, and you're having such a good time and you realize, oh, I got, this is the last song. I got to take this crap home. <laughs> yeah. Well, I realized, uh, last night we had an hour long set. Mm. Uh, actually it was like 55 minutes, but this morning, uh, in talking with some of my band members, we were kind of, uh. Chuckling at the fact that it felt like 15 minutes. Yeah, but you know, we were up there for 55 minutes I remember playing House of Blues and we had one set and it felt like it was over with two songs Yeah, and and it just because it was a good time and and it was one of those also You know, I'm sure for you you were like this is exactly what I wanted to do at this point in life This, this is I've been planning and working towards this. Yeah, I mean, I, I wish I was that calculated. Oh, okay uh, realistically <laughs> There was nine of us. We had uh, three rehearsals leading really? up and at zero times, zero times leading up to this, did we have all nine of us in the same room. Wow. In fact, one of the members of our band didn't even join the band until Wednesday. Um, here's to be a ballsy. Yeah. <laughs> and welcome to room yeah. six. <laughs> mm. So like you, I took a hiatus or, or two uh, of a year or two uh, for music in the past and I emerged with a different musical direction and vision. I did a little, you know, little research, read some of your interviews and things like that, and it, and I saw a lot of my path and, and your path, kind of the same thing. What was the turning point that made you decide I'm going to come back to to doing music and, and the whole making an album and everything? Well, I feel like um, I feel like uh, my origin story has been told like more often than Batman's. Okay, but like so basically, what happened was I used to go by Devastate years ago. I was a very very right. run of the mill. 
uh, backpack wrapper. Since we were 12, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. since I was 12. So um, I went under the alias Devastate. Um, I did a, a form of backpack wrap that we called like space wrap. Basically just incredibly difficult and verbose like hip hop. Okay, so sounds a little bit like logic. Logic wishes. Oh wow! Ooh. Not not to say that I'm better than logic, but I'm saying I, I think I mean he can't hold the candles of the complexity that was like the mid two thousands like space rap movement. It was more of like idea. Um, Sage Francis, Aesop Rock, Aesop Rock's kind of the one that like really like broke out of that. And you had like smaller acts like Icon, the Mike King, uh, the Last Emperor, both mm -hmm. from Philadelphia, both friends of mine, uh, that had like pretty successful careers. So I uh, was of that uh, ilk. So then in around early, the early decade, I uh, really started experiments with like playing instruments on stage. One of my idols who subsequently became a great friend of mine named Lewis Logic. Not to be confused with Logic. Right. Lewis Logic, who had a very, very unique and great career in the um, in the 2000s, was like playing piano. I was like, man, I want to play instruments on stage. So I began playing ukulele on stage. And um, I remember having a show where a guy who had been to like every Devastate show and like every Devastate song was really like personally offended by the fact that I played an instrument. If you were his Bob Dylan when he went electric. Yeah, so I really, yeah. <laughs> How dare I, you? I really, really upset him. And I woke up one day to an uncharitable description of who I am by this guy. And at that point I realized I was just disenchanted. Yep. And I was no longer interested in being Devastate. So I just kind of disappeared for a little bit. And you, and actually had a you, you did a brilliant thing I think by kind of di disappearing and killing off Devastate. Yeah, with the Devastate is dead. You did your research. Yeah, huh. yeah apparently. I'm not there yet. I'm not there. <laughs> um, I, I really I was actually impre properly impressed. I was like, he had a bit of a plan with that. I mean, it wasn't. It, not it, you would think. I did it. Well, what I mean is, that at some point you're like, okay, I'm going to do this. Yeah, you know the cool thing about it was. I came with the idea nine days before it launched, and I had the t-shirts made, mm -hmm. and luckily a local um, company called Game Over Merch really liked the idea, and they were like, there's not enough time to do this, but we like your idea, so we're going to make it happen. Nice. So they made a bunch of uh, Devastated Dead shirts for me, and that's when I like put it into motion, but realistically, the plan was like five days before we started it, and when I came up with the plan, I thought it was going to be like 15 friends. And it ended up being like three hundred friends, strangers, fans. Nice. I yeah. liked the uh, the little fake uh, news article. That was, that yeah, was the nice fake news time. article. And then you know what? Like it led to. I, I remember. Um, we did Devastate Us Dead. We launched it on November first, which was Day of the Dead. Right. And um, you had those muertos. Yep. And I had this agreement with everybody who participated that they would change their Facebook profile post or their Instagram into like their own little murder scene that I would help facilitate and then disappear for the day. The street team. Yeah. So it was really interesting because like police got involved. Oh, shit. Like <laughs> mothers were wondering if their children were okay. Oh. And I got like a phone call from like CBS. They're like, hey, this idea he did is really cool. We'd like to discuss it. And I got the interview with CBS, did it all, and they never aired it because... Like, it was yeah. an issue. Yeah, a little bit. It was Imagine little, nowadays. Yeah. So it was a little bit of an issue because I killed off 300 people. And, like, they were fairly <laughs> grotesque, like, murder scenes. Some, wow. some of them were easy. Mm -hmm. and But I allowed people to, like, have the liberty to be creative. So some of them were very easy. Some of them were, like, gruesome. And wow. CBS, quite like I said, they brought me in. They interviewed me. Everything was good to go. And then I got, like, an email the following morning, like, hey, we can't air this. Right. But it got picked up by the Las Vegas Weekly, which is a local publication mm -hmm. we have out here. And like one day, I mean, the week before, in the same area that I was, it was a giant article on Justin Bieber. And the very next week, it's me killing off people. And it was the first like bit of publication I had. And yeah. I hadn't even released the song yet. So it was Gregory Michael Davis, this new brand. And I just... I did this whole entire thing. I had a whole entire page in Las Vegas Weekly dedicated to me. I mean, and then I get a phone call from a local venue going, "Hey, 
I was like, you guys haven't even heard my music. It could suck. Yeah, but I'm just I, I just lucked into this marketing thing. Yeah, it really worked out. Yeah. <laughs> well, if you ever you know if the music thing doesn't work out, look into marketing. You seem to have an edge. Yeah, it seems awful. Yeah, it it it's been there, done that, and yeah. it's 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 a bit of a soul suck. Yeah, that's how it feels draining. Yeah. So, uh, moving on. Okay. Your videos, mm -hmm. especially, are very visceral. Okay. And and with that, with the sound off. Sometimes it almost seems like they don't match up with the lyrics a little bit. No, was, yeah, I'm a big fan of dissonance. Yeah, and I, I got that, right? I was like, I, I, no, I see what you're doing. I see what you're doing there, and I'm digging it. Um, are the design ideas mostly yours or were they a collaboration with, um, I can't remember the name of it right now, the uh, production company that did the videos? Oh, well, I mean, different production companies for each video. Oh, I thought mm -hmm. I saw the same name. Uh, no. Oh, okay. Different production company for, uh, well, for the two horror videos for different production companies. Okay. Um, so it was this one thing where, um, I, I decided I want to do this blindfold trick. I used to do blindfold trick as Devastate, but it was different. Mm -hmm. I would have people raise something in the air and I would freestyle about what they had blindfolded and it would just be like what I felt. So it was this really cool thing where people would be really pumped to hear me rap about their car keys, right? You know, <laughs> okay. like, you know, you're blindfolded, they know you can't see it. I would have, I would test it out with somebody, mm -hmm. you know, kind of like the magician trick. And, um, so we did this new one. I wanted to do this while I was playing piano blindfolded. And my mom, who always made the blindfold for me, decided to put buttons on one. Oh, okay, that was actually my next question. Where yeah. did the buttons idea come from? Because it's a bit Coraline. You know? Yeah, uh, not in any way in reference to Coraline. I get the Yeah, as soon as connection. I saw it, I'm like, is that a reference or was that something totally separate? And then you're telling, you're saying your, your mom's like, what if I put buttons on your well, blindfold? I believe that it all started, the button thing all started right after David Bowie's death. Oh, really? My mom's a huge David Bowie fan. I think she got the idea from the Lazarus music video. I don't know that to be a fact. Okay. Oh, that's, yep, yep, yep. I don't know that to be a fact, but I believe, I'd say that she likely did. Oh. Uh, I had nothing to do with Coraline. I am a Neil Gaiman fan. Mm -hmm. I do like Coraline, but that's not where I came from. Okay. The, uh, the button thing kind of just comes from my, um, passion for like, I would antique is not the right word, but like Victorian things. Like I like lamps. Right. Um, I like lantern looking things. I do like, like wooden buttons. Um, if I had, you know, infinite money. <laughs> I have really creepy stuff in my house. I, I like like pre-prohibition style stuff as well, like um, like speakeasies, like that that look like a speakeasy. So I've always been a fan of like stuff right. like that, and the button just kind of falls in line with that. Which is a perfect segue. Yeah. Into your fashion game. Okay. Now there's a there's you've got a very like it's it's your own style. At the same time, it's it's. Not like you're going really, really crazy, but I would call it person current yet vintage. Uh, I think that's fair. I mean, if we were going to talk fashion, we're wearing something better than this. But yeah, that's fine. I mean, uh, that's, this is me. I don't dress like this all the time. Yeah. But uh, where did your sense of style come from? You think where did that sense that sense of I dig this vintage stuff. I'm going to incorporate it in. I think a lot of that came and due just from the entire transition from uh, Devastate to Gregory Michael Davis. I wanted. To, I used to have very long hair. Me too. Um, I used to have like hair down in my very lower back and I got tired of that. Mm -hmm. So I just made a giant transition. And at the time, I like the, the final like whimpers of Devastate. I was, um, Last gasps. Yeah, I was dating this girl, uh, who was very fashion forward. I just felt like a schlub every time I went out with her. So I started like dressing like a little better. Mm -hmm. And then just like anything, you know, like, People go, oh, you look great. So you go, well, how do I look better? You yeah. know, so it was just, I had the body type for it. Mm -hmm. Tall and slender, not a lot of people have that. So I dress like a European dude because <clears throat> I'm built like a European dude. Um, I mean, I don't know that they actually dress like that, but I, I imagine they do. But I like uh, I like things that accentuate my length, like three-quarter coats, mm -hmm. uh, ties, uh, waistcoats, stuff like that. And it, it, it suits you. I feel like it does, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I wasn't sure when you came today, whether you were going to be like pimping it up like that. Or you know what? Normally I would. I got to be honest with you. I'm tired. I, you know what? Yeah, we did the other show last night. Yeah. 
So you did your show right. You should be yeah, no. out. I'm, I'm, thank you so much for coming. No, really. of course. We had a, we had a great day yeah. at the pool uh, earlier today. Nice, great day at the pool. Um, mom cooked breakfast. Breakfast, nothing better than that. Uh, we want to do this, so I was like, hey, you know what? I'll throw in a button up. I'm not gonna come in swim shorts. You could have. <laughs> I got a pool. We should have done um, that at some Brought point. The whole party here. Speaking of which, if you're watching this and you have been on this this show. At some point this year, I plan on having a little pool party barbecue get together for everybody that's been on Room Six. Oh, I love that! And and basically, you guys come and hang out. Maybe even my my jazz band might perform for you guys. Uh, we're we'll, we're we'll, we'll figuring that out. But uh, it's it would be nice to have everybody come over and just chill and just hang out. Maybe network and and um, maybe I'll have some new questions. Hmm. <laughs> well, there we go. Um, your background in astronomy and physics obviously influenced your songwriting on your latest the latest album, One Damn Song. Yep. Especially with this tribute to Henrietta Leavitt and the female computers that helped us get to the moon. Yeah, oh, yep. Yep. What other subjects influenced that CD? A lot of stuff. Um, I don't want to be too much of a, um, too nitpicky, but Henrietta Leavitt was more about, like, uh, variables in stars. Okay. So less to do with moon, more to do with... That's um, moon? Yeah. I meant space. Yeah. As you see, it says, I, I, typed, I, I hit the word space. Well, she did a lot more of, um, of like, turning conceptual physics into, like, real. Right. She did break down barriers a little bit. And so, yeah. Incredibly so. Like, yeah. she, she inspired uh, Hubble to do the research that uh, discovered that the universe is expanding. So mm -hmm. Henrietta uh, Swan Levin is one of the absolute giants of astronomy, yeah. uh, uh, oh, along with a lot of people from that era. But... As far as the album is concerned, a lot of stuff went into it. Um, I mean, it took a long time, as you mentioned, uh, to make. So, a lot of stuff were like ideas that I tinkered with and I was, you know, devastated. I was like, ah, this isn't a devastate song. So, I would just kind of like, you know, keep it up my sleeve for a little bit. Um, oh, so you, you've had a lot of this stuff packed away for a while. Well, yeah. So, like... Um, Take Me Home was influenced by some random girl who walked up to me at Beauty Bar. Like, we're talking years ago. Like, nine years ago, ten years ago. Mm -hmm. And her boyfriend just cheated on her. Oh, yeah. And she told me she that she didn't ask, she demanded that I buy her a beer and then take me her home. Danger, danger will rob us. Yeah, so I was like, <laughs> ah, that's probably not going to happen, but I don't care how drunk, that. I don't care how drunk you are. That's, yeah. That's, that's red flags. Um, so, uh, so like, I, that happened in, like, 2009, and um, I never felt like I could write about this. I was I felt very, very uh, cornered. Yeah. I was devastated. But then there's a lot of stuff that came up, like, um, you know, Orbit is comparing uh, falling in love to looking at the universe. Mm -hmm. uh, looking through telescopes, kind of the idea. Like um, I can see that kind of that whole. You realize you're, you're uh, things are bigger than me. A yeah, well, uh, I mean, Giordano Bruno once said that the realization of the universe's immensity is like falling in love. So it's so kind you, of you went the op you flipped it on. Yeah, I went uh, falling in love is like realizing the universe's immensity. So inspired by that, um, it's storm the air is about performing in front of nobody. Uh, the mayor's uh, dealing with the death of my grandmother as well as my biggest idol, mm -hmm. which is David Bowie. So, I mean, it's inspired by, you know, recent things. Um, Get, real quick, sideline. Uh, see, the the mayor and... Um, which one is it where supposedly you kidnapped some girls? Oh, Voices. Voices, in my head, right. Um, that was where the Coraline thing really was like, is this... Is, is it all influenced by Coraline? Because you right. have buttons on the girls' eyes. Well, no, the button thing has been basically the insignia for Gregory Michael Davis since, um, right. right after the inception. Well, now that I know that, that it wasn't, it was more your, your mom saying, hey, let's, you know, let's try this. Right. I get now why it, that immediate, that it, uh, eventually led to, let's put it on the, you know, girl's eyes. Right. And so it, I was coming at it the other way saying, where did that come from? And thinking, well, it reminds me of Coraline because the buttons were eyes. So. Well, um, so in this stage mm -hmm. of Gregory Michael Davis, I uh, might I only use this in third person because it's not just me. It's a, it's a big group effort. But um, in this stage of Gregory Michael Davis, the button is the insignia. Mm -hmm. um, we already know what the insignia is for the next stage. But also in this stage, the theme is horror. But not just horror, but like, eh, like passive horror. 
uh, such as voices, such as mayor, right. uh, they're slightly ambiguous. And ambiguity has always been my ally. It struck me kind of almost like that, a good horror movie where it's slowly building, 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 building the tension. Mm -hmm. That's what it kind of struck me. It's like there's something coming, like you said. Like you, there's, there's, you, you have things planned down oh, yeah, the road. Oh yeah, I never do. Where uh, is is it's not like um like a pop horror like Billie Eilish. Sure. No, I don't. I, I'm honestly not even familiar with her. Mm. Uh, it's really interesting because when I first started putting music on Spotify, yeah, uh, a friend of mine has like um, um, she doesn't have premium, so in order to listen to my music, she has to put it on the shuffle, and I always come up <laughs> in like Billie Eilish. That's what. That's like what Billie what Eilish and Greg Michael Davis. I couldn't name a single song by her. But I mean, people love her. I'm, so I'm not. I'm not speaking pejoratively. My 11 year old daughter it, it loves her. Well, then you should turn on to Gregory Michael Davis. I mean, apparently Gregory Michael Davis apparently. is for fans of Billy Eilish. Yeah, right. But um, um, I, I, one thing. I, well, the thing I like about Billy Eilish is it. It's um, the music is is it's catchy. It, it is a bit of an earworm. Sure. I mean, the guy says, worms. "I'm the bad guy," and then she goes, "Duh." <laughs> right. And it's just one of those lines you just wait for in a song. And you're like, "Oh, I know this song." Right. Um, no, I mean, I'm a big fan of Pop Sensibilities. Yeah. Huge fan. Um, your current album, yep. which, last night was all about that album, right? Correct. One okay. damn song. Current album, make sure I got my notes right. <laughs> um, it showcases your multiple influences, including your, the rap game. Mm -hmm. And you've got some nice flow there. Do you still do any music from Devastate, or do you have any plans to incorporate any of the Devastate songs? No, for, um, for the diehard fans. No, nah, no, nah, never. Um, it's funny. Yesterday, I had somebody wearing a Devastate shirt. It was hilarious. I like it was really funny. So you don't wear the shirt of the guy you're going to see unless you wear the shirt of the guy who he killed. Yeah, I think that's awesome. And yeah. I wish that, that would have been. Yeah, I, I say you should have been like. You know, I mentioned it. Yeah, I kind of want to trade him a Gregory McDaniel shirt for his. Let me shirt. upgrade your game. <laughs> yeah, well, no, I just wanted like to have it. Mm -hmm. uh, it's like memorabilia, but. Um. No, I don't ever really do Devastate stuff because Devastate requires a certain headspace. Uh, I'm too much that. of a method performer. I did a five-year anniversary show um, for the only Devastate EP. Now, um, that was uh, in... That came out in 2012. Mm -hmm. So we did it January 2018, which is about two months off. But I may do a 10-year... We had a sold out show, which was really strange um, to see because I never had a sold out show. It was devastating. <laughs> I, actually, that's not true. I had one sold out show and devastated at a place called the Box Office. Mm. Uh, but it was like the small room inside the Box Office is a dual room place. Uh, small room in the Box Office because they were doing construction on the other half. So it was like a 70 person room. I was going to say, isn't it like 20 people? It feels full already. Yeah, so yeah. it's like a 70 person room. So that was a sell out. Um, and then I had a sellout in Connecticut, but that was quite literally like a 30 person room. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I wish I had pictures. Of it was so funny. I mean, in some ways, I almost prefer those. The, the, the real intimate, like, they're literally in your face. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, I mean, but this was like the first show I had that broke like 100. Okay. As like Devastate, which was also a sellout at this place that we were performing at. I may do a 10 year anniversary, but. I remembered when I was preparing for the Devastate show, like, I was very mentally unhealthy because mm. it, it required me to get back into the emotions that inspired these songs. Um, but, I think that, but that speaks highly of you as a performer and that you care enough to give your audience that, to, to, to do that for your audience. Well, I did, a, like, I did a lot of the same cheesy Devastate jokes. Right. Um, I wore a wig for the long hair. Um, I performed the exact same way I performed, but I did um, almost like a uh, chronological timeline. Mm. I did like the f the earliest Devastate song that I could get the instrumentals for up until the last Devastate song that I ever wrote, which is coincidentally the first Gregory Michael Davis song I ever wrote. <laughs> yeah, so, nice. uh, so I did this whole entire thing from like 2004 to 2014 when I wrote Storm the Air, which is actually how the album ends. But yeah, so I may do a 10 year anniversary of um, of the Zero EP where I performed the whole EP and some other Devastate mm -hmm. songs. But I mean, I don't... Here's, I'm here's, not here's a, guaranteeing it. Here's a little seed I want to plant. What about a bonus track on every new Greg and Mike Davis thing where you you put some Devastate track? So, so one of the past ones. But you just put it on there as a bonus track so people will be like, Hey, I know that. Hey, <laughs> yeah, no, that's something I like. I, they're so they're so conflicting in their approaches to music. 
Uh, in my book, I actually write about the difference between writing songs as devastating and writing songs as well, right, my favorite. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, so I do, for people out there that, that care, mm -hmm. at a five track EP is Devastate, which is one through five. Links will be in the description. I have a one song release that I released right before the Devastate show. Um, that's the sixth song. And this album starts, at, uh, the track listing starts at number seven. Nice. So the track listing for one damn song doesn't start at one, it starts at seven. <laughs> and I'm not going to give any information of what goes next because it is very calculated. But I'll keep the track, uh, track listing going. So the track listing begins at Devastate and it will go up more and more with regard to Michael Davis and maybe any other projects I do. Cool. Uh, we're going to take a quick little, little break here because my dog wants to go out. <laughs> and make it happen. We're back. Quick question. Mm -hmm. Do you still want the superpower to transport urine? That's a great idea. I still think it's a great idea. I know people think it's crazy, but if you think about this, you never have to get up to go to the bathroom. Right? Which is a genius thing. It, yeah. yeah. Especially if you've been drinking. <laughs> yeah. Never have to get up to go to the bathroom. Um, and you get to um, really make life uncomfortable for other people. Which I can think of I can think of a few people in positions of power that, that would be great. Yeah, imagine just like transferring urine into like your enemy's bladder. Yeah, like whatever their plan was. <laughs> yeah, they're just going to be at the stall for the next foreseeable future. <laughs> oh, and, and, and quite unsure why. Yeah, it's just like, I don't get it. I had one glass of water. Exactly. Um... <laughs> That's it. I love it how the the hero or supervillain is just sitting there just pounding water. <laughs> like, I'm gonna take you down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, how long have you been in Vegas? Oh, I, I did most of my upbringing here. Okay. Um, how long have you? Well, it's not really asking how long you've been Gregory Michael Davis because we we just went over that. Um, and you've been doing music really before Devastate, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, like, I tinker with stuff as a kid. I've been pretty much, like, writing, quote-unquote, like, rap songs mm -hmm. uh, since I was five. Right on. But, um, never really experimented aside from that until my mid-20s. Okay. So, like, this new, this, uh, current persona is still quite new to me. Right on. Which actually is your original persona. Yeah. <laughs> um, early musical influences were pretty much... The, the rap. Oh, it was all hip-hop. I mean, no, yeah. like, my original favorite song was One, Two, Three, Four by Coolio. Mm. Then, uh, like, Rosa Parks by uh, by Outkast off of their Equemini album. What about the Alphabet song? The Blackalicious one? Yeah. Um, actually, I got Black into Blackalicious. Uh, Blackalicious, well, Gift of Gab, the rapper from Blackalicious, in my opinion, is the third best rapper of all time. But I never really got into them for, like, their gimmicky stuff. Like, even just their album, Mia, in my opinion, is maybe the best hip-hop album ever made. Uh, Blazing, Air uh, Blazing Arrow is probably a top five hip-hop album ever made. Black Malicious as a duo has an incredibly, incredibly strong catalog. And I would say the only guess, catalog yeah. that really rivals it is The Roots. I can get behind From that. a hip-hop, uh, an outcast, to be fair. All right, uh, moving to current musical influences, obviously... You, you've just finished the show, now it's time to back away for a bit, mm -hmm. but who are you listening to now that kind of, you know, gets your juices flowing? Um, <coughs> my current favorite bands, um, I, I think, I think Arcade Fire is the best band in the world. They're not my favorite band. Mm -hmm. I think they're the best. Well, they're Canadian. Yeah, so. they're Canadian. Uh, big fan of Vampire Weekend. I love, uh, MGMT. Okay. Um, to... The dismay of a lot of people because I never stopped listening to them. Uh, well, big fan of like Sufjan Stevens. Uh, I think Jack Antonoff mm -hmm. is the best pop songwriter. He is um, the guy from uh, Bleachers. If you don't mind, thanks. He's the guy from Bleachers. He um, uh, did guitar and wrote songs for fun. He wrote a lot of Taylor Swift's 1989 album, wrote the entire Lord album. That just came out, wrote a lot of songs in the new Love and Del Rey album. Oh, wow. So I think Jack Antonoff is, is probably the best doing it. Love Unknown Mortal Orchestra. Love, um... I'm hearing a lot of things that are not necessarily what I would equate with your music. Nah, I mean... Which I, is good. I think, it good, I think it, good influences are, this makes me want to write music, but not like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, 
I do want to write music like that. I'm just not as good as they are. <laughs> so I have to write it like the way I write it instead. Yeah. If yeah. I was good enough to be like a chameleon, it'd be great. But yeah. not. Instead, you had one at your show. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Here we go. Um, normally, I ask that most hated of interview questions, which is how do you define a musical style? But I think we kind of covered that. Well, um, my favorite thing was I had a radio station refer to my music as sophisticated pop. Yeah, and that's what I stick with. I like sophista pop. I like it. I like it a lot. In fact, I think that covers your fashion style too. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I think it's apropos. Okay. Well, again, normally this is a little different from you doing it the day after the big show. Mm -hmm. But I normally, ask what, what what's your favorite show memory? And I think that would have to be last night, right? Honestly, yeah. And I mean, I don't even use that with um, like recency bias. Um, last night was great. I really enjoyed Rhino Fest, which was a strange, strange devastate gate in Vermont. Um, yeah, I would say that. Although, actually, you know what? When it was all said and done, I really liked the final devastate show, the one we did last year. So, okay. I mean, I could see that because of the moment that it was. Yeah, it was very cathartic. Yeah. Uh, Devastate didn't really have like a, a goodbye. It just like ended. And then one day, <laughs> I I did, yeah, one day I did the Devastate was dead thing, but that was after Devastate was realistically dead for three years. Um, so I would say. Thank you. Uh, the final Devastate show, which I um, playfully referred to as Devapalooza. And, um, <laughs> and then uh, oh, the last time was a lot of fun. Rhino Fest was a lot of fun. Extreme thing in 2013. Teen was a lot of fun. Right. And yeah, I would say those are probably my favorite. Cool. Um, you got a favorite venue? Uh, TLA in uh, Philadelphia, Theater of the Living Arts. Okay. Yeah. Cool. I, I'm not familiar with it at all, but. Right have... on South Street, directly across the street from my favorite cheesesteak place. <laughs> Funny you should say that. We had cheesesteaks last night, actually. Great, they're great. Right after the dentist. <laughs> I was like, yeah, okay, I'll get it. You want me to get. Cheetos and Oreos too? Okay, sure. Do it. Yeah, I should have done it before. Um, again, don't know if this really applies to you, but is there a dream show that you want to play? That doesn't yeah. apply to me at all. Yeah, it doesn't apply to you at all. Like, I just did it. Uh, not even just that, but I don't... I don't know. I'm, t I'm too calculated to have like a dream show. Um, and yet at the same time, you do things sometimes last minute. Yeah, I, I mean, that doesn't... I don't think that takes away from uh, how calculated I am. Everything right. that I've done, I've been thinking about for a while. That, that doesn't yeah. mean that I've acted on it. Right, exactly. Execution and is not my forte. I try to be the same way where I got not so much plans, but contingencies. If, you know, if then, like, like I got logic statements. Right. Yeah, back to logic. If, I got, if I, I got logic statements that are there from just years and years of, and that, you know, when this happens, this will happen. Right. And, and, but until then, I'm not going to agonize over it. Or, or Yeah, well, I mean, I'm, I'm very, very much a thinker. Mm -hmm. This is how I'm entire, I mean, I wrote a book. You it's know, like, true. I wrote, I wrote a book as a companion piece to my album, and it's not even a companion piece to my album. It's, it's standalone. Yeah. It, I, I mean, I, it can be. I'm embarrassed to say that I did not get a chance to actually look at the book. Right. I, well, not a lot of people did. Yeah, so tell people. Uh, it's a book. Yeah, what's it called? Um, I don't have a name for it. Then that makes it hard yeah. to find. <laughs> so what it is, is I wrote a book from my album's perspective. So it's an autobiography about my album written by my album. And so my album was a functioning anthropomorphic being. Um, and it just allowed me to basically bridge the gap between songwriting and philosophy while also being very honest and critical of who I am as a human being, but also courteous to who I am as a human being. So it was a very uh, therapeutic endeavor, but it's um, more than anything, it's, quite a, it's a philosophy book more than anything. It sounds really cool, just the whole concept of it. I would love to read it. How would, yeah. I, how would I get access to it? Well, I'd know it to you. I'm never coming down here again, that's for sure. Maybe for the, the pool party. <laughs> yes. He lives 400 miles away. <laughs> But he's in the hood. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm out to you. I'm out to you. Uh, Thanks, man. I think it's a t shirt, vinyl, if you want. It's anyway. The vi I definitely want the vinyl since you don't have CDs of it. Yeah. Um, he's so vintage. Yeah. Yes. I'll skip the usual jokes about kids and, and what vinyl is. Um, let's talk gear. Mm -hmm. what, are you, what were you rocking last night? Um, I have a new. I personally have a. Um, an ukulele and a piano on stage as well, some percussion, 
percussion instruments. Okay. Also have a toy grand piano. And I don't mean... I did see that in the... Uh, the, the... Pumps Las Vegas, I think. Yeah. yeah. So it's an actual toy grand piano. It's like a $500 instrument. Jesus. Um, I have some uh, fairly like archaic versions of melodica. I have an incredible oh, I accordion. Melodica. I have a harmonica that survived World War II. Wow. I have a, uh, a, a hollow organ from the 1970s. I have a lot of stuff. I collect like uh, vintage like key instruments. So the piano, is it a proper piano or is it a keyboard? It's a keyboard. But I have a 1920s um, player's piano as well. Of course he does. And what's, uh, what is the keyboard? Uh, it's, it's a basic Casio. That's but, like, it, it has all my needs. Right. It's 88 keys. Um, uh, it's very, it's easily transportable. It does, the tonality of it is great. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm simple folk. Like, I, I just need it for the uh, piano setting. It has a great piano setting. Right. I wouldn't recommend any of the additional settings. <laughs> Vibraphone, <laughs> all that stuff sounds like trash. Vibraphone, yeah, yes. But, like, yeah. the, uh, just the basic grand setting mm -hmm. is perfect. Uh, now today he'll be performing on my electric Yamaha Yamaha uh, yeah. piano, uh, just because I apparently live out in BFE. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, silly question, but do you have any dream gear? Anything you've been lusting after that you'd love to get? You say you're simple folk. Uh, I'd love to answer that question, but I can't answer that question without giving out what's coming up next. Ah, uh, okay. Well, from the highs of dream gear to the lows of losing gear, you ever lose gear? Nah. Never forget. You're that, you're that guy that's still talking right now. We gotta pack everything away first. I mean, I've lost, like, stuff that I couldn't even remember telling you, like, uh... Oh, okay. Like, um, like, cords, quarter inches. Um... There, it, well, yeah. I lose a lot of batons. Batons? Like, conductor batons. Okay. I lose I, tell me of, more. <laughs> uh, well, I, Let's unpack that a little yeah, bit. <laughs> I had a bit that I used to use a baton on stage, um, and I just kept losing them. Were you thrown in the crowd or something? I don't know what's happening to them, honestly. It's like when I was a kid, I used to always lose a sock, and I could never well, figure that, that out. That happens to everybody. But yeah. Same thing, I think. The same person stole my socks when I was a kid. <laughs> they evolved into baton theft. All right. Last question. You okay. made it. Let's pretend we're talking to a new musician. Okay. Doesn't matter the instrument, really. Any maintenance tips? Get a haircut. Wow. Get a haircut. Yeah. Look your best. Feel good. Hey, goddamn millennials don't know. Yeah. Um, but aside from that, any maintenance tips for your gear? Um, or even for just your yourself or your show or whatever? I mean, I think, look, if you find out what makes you feel maintained. Okay. For some people, uh, this organization is a form of organization. That mm -hmm. works for you to do it. I mean, you know, there's too many variables to being a musician that it's very, very hard to give advice without coming off as though you know more than they do. The fact of the matter is... Even the successful ones have no idea what the hell they're doing. Yeah. And that's great. And that allows us to be unique musicians. So my thing is, as a musician, maintain yourself. Yeah. Maintain yourself. Uh, if you feel good, I mean, if you look good, you're going to feel good. Um, if your instruments look good and that allows you to feel good, make your instruments look good. Or at least sound good. Yeah. If you need six months off from writing music to be the best you can be, take six months off from writing music. Mm -hmm. Um so my advice to any musician who thinks that they're are, are, are not maintained, mm -hmm. figure out how to maintain yourself and everything else will fall into place. <laughs> Get your life together. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, stick around. We're going to go up to room six, in front of the guitar wall, and hear him plunk some keys. So thank you, and we'll see you in just a minute. And so wrote this song with bad boys to share, no instruments to play. So I just strum the air. They just stand and stare, pretend they were listening. So I strum the air, not knowing what I'm missing. And so wrote this song with bad boys to share, no instruments to play. So I just strum the air. They just stand and stare, pretend they were listening. So I strum the air, not knowing what I'm missing. 
Stop for a second, pull up a chair, you know this town's a lot nicer when there's nobody here You can hear this old skate when you open your beer, spike drink fine when you've been sober for years Sing your heart out, say you'll be fine, but who needs talent when they notice your fears? I can look at your failures, look at the mind, why well, swallow pride when you choke on your tears? The notice of the strong when you noticed at all, each word just crashed lands in a blind eye We spent our lives looking down a road in the fall, but look at the sky The moment the time flies, our shelf life's done, before we're fine, why we sacrifice eight? Convince we have nine lives, but Place of courage to show us my lives of flame from the stomach. Hope it will slide by while I try by time. Wait for the earth, take ambient, mimic the dirt nap. All prize tried by the time we learn that God made listen, but we'll never converse back. It hurts that worst facts, but in the scene, we'll come down to earth just to muddy your dreams. Crow circle and your hope comes in a beam. Everybody watches and nobody sees. And song wrote this song with that voice to share, no instruments to play, so why just strum the air? They just stand and stare, pretending they were listening. So I strum the air, not knowing what I'm missing. There's a girl that I know, trapped inside a stranger by sea, lost inside a bottle, drowning in a bottle. There's a girl that I love, releasing hatred in me, and I can't smash the bottle. There's a girl who can't swim, but yet she's anchored to me. Never saw the beach, only got the sand. She only left the bottle when she sank in the sea. And all the shards of glass are tearing through my hands And so wrote the song without a voice to share, no instruments to play. So I just strum the air. They just stand and stare, pretending they will listen. So I strum the air, not knowing what I'm missing. And so wrote the song without a voice to share, no instruments to play. So I just strum the air. They just stand and stare, pretending they will listen. So I strum the air, not knowing what I'm missing. thank Gregory Michael Davis for coming by. It was a great interview and a great performance. If you want to know more from him, go ahead and uh, click here. If you'd like to subscribe, click here. Uh, if you'd like to support the content you love, please consider clicking one of the links down in the description. And uh, remember to be amazing. We'll see you next time on Room 6.